our guest is steroided Trojan, and the Trojan is something that does something unexpected, but the problem is asking for it to do that, then wouldn't it be expecting it? Like, is that problem impossible at that point? Is that undecidable? <laughs> Not sure I understand the question. Okay, so Trojan is just supposed to do something unexpected. So the point is the person running it expects it to be... The grader expects it to do something unexpected, so therefore it, it's not unexpected <laughs> behavior anymore. And uh, okay. So you should it do not nothing? Really, yeah, then it would be unexpected. <laughs> Maybe if it did something expected, it would be unexpected. Right? So, uh, okay, you got me on that one. Uh, okay, it just needs to do something unexpected. Okay, you got, you got, you got the idea. Uh, it needs to look like it's doing something, but do something else. Uh, that's our definition of a, of, a, of a Trojan. Okay, so how do we detect malware? Okay, turn, let's turn this around. Let's be the good guys for a while and try to, to detect these uh, malware problems. Uh, there's three techniques that are widely used and variations on these as well, and other techniques are used in combination with these. But the basic techniques are signature detection, change detection, and anomaly detection. Uh, we're going to look at each of these, and basically what we want to do is compare the advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so which one of these is most widely used? Signature. signature. I mean, when you do your virus scan, it's a signature scan, okay? It does a few other things, but primarily that's focused on signature scan. What is a signature? Sequence of bytes. It's a what? Sequence of bytes. It really, it's literally a sequence of bits, right, that show up in a particular file. And it's looking for this sequence of sequence of bits that shows up in a particular malware, okay, some virus somewhere. And so it's going to scan through a bunch of files looking for this sequence of bits. What happens if you find that sequence of bits? Mm -hmm. well, think about that, okay. Okay, so signature detection. So signature literally is a string of bits. Now it may include wildcards and various other things as well, but you're really looking for a pattern, okay, a fixed pattern that you expect to see in uh, some malware. Okay, think about it. Uh, this should be pretty fast, looking for a string of bits through the files in your system. Why does it take forever to do a virus scan? You have too many files. Too many signatures. Yeah, too many files and too many signatures, okay? You have a lot of signatures and a lot of data that you need to scan. So that's why it takes so long. There are clever techniques, you know, that make it more efficient than doing, you know, sort of one at a time, but it still takes a long time to do. Okay, so anyway, we, we're looking for some particular string of bits. We may include wildcards. Conceivably, it could be a hash or something like that that you're looking for as well, but typically it's just a string of bits. Uh, and here's an example from a virus from not too long ago. Uh, you know, this string of bits. Now, if you're, you know, you're working at Symantec or wherever, uh, how do you pick the signature? There's lots of bits in that file, right? How do you decide which ones you're going to look for? You want something unique. Ideally, you want something unique, something that doesn't show up in any other code. What's the chance that you're going to find something unique that doesn't show up anywhere in any other code or any other file? Not, Not very good, okay, because this represents code, right? I mean, probably code could be data, I guess, but mostly it's code. There aren't that many uh, different op codes that show up in assembly code, right? Each of those has some representation. So the chances are you could see this somewhere else, but you want something that's unlikely to show up somewhere else. Okay, so now you're scanning through a bunch of files, you see this particular signature, and what do you do? <coughs> Delete the file, of course, right? No? Why not? Could be a false positive. It could be a false positive. Okay, so this can actually show up in other files. You need to be a little bit careful. We, you want something that doesn't show up very often, so you don't have to worry about it. You know, when you find that you're pretty confident it's a virus, you may... Uh, typically, what, uh, off, what happens often is that it will quarantine the file and will ask you to look at it or may do some additional testing or whatever to decide whether it's a problem. But additional work is required. So you don't want to you know, give too many false alarms, right? Or your virus product's not going to be too popular. Uh, okay, so we're looking for this particular string of bits. You know, if we find it, uh, you know, we search through all the files, yes. Uh, if we find it, we're not certain that we found the virus. That's, that's an important 
important point. You may have to do additional testing. You may have to even ask the user to look at it, you know, give, you know, give their okay or not, which is always dangerous, right? Okay, now there's actually, uh, if you look at this, there's, uh, I think, 28, uh, 112 uh, bits here. So, you know, if code was really random, if these were just random bits, the chance you'd find this somewhere else would be only one in two to the 112, right? Which would never happen, because that's such a small number. But the fact is it represents, you know, actual code, and code is not random bits, okay? So there is a realistic chance, even with 112 bits, that you could find a match somewhere else. Now, it's kind of a trade-off here, right? If you think about it, when you're scanning, you would like it to be a small number of bits, because it's easier to scan for a small number of bits, but you'd like it to be a large number of bits, so you have fewer false positives, right? So, you know, lots of trade-offs here. And they do other tricks, you know, they will look for signatures that have common prefixes, right? So if they see that prefix, they could, you know, potentially have detected, there could have been a lot of different viruses, and then they just need to look a little bit more, so they just scan for the prefix initially, and then look for the rest of the signatures if they find that prefix. You know, lots of tricks like that. And there are some clever algorithms. I don't know, did anybody take my malware class last semester? You'd have seen all this stuff, okay? Anyway. Uh, okay, so what's the big advantage of signature detection? Must be some advantage. You guys use it all the time, right? I and mean, the biggest advantage is it works. <laughs> I mean, it basically works on most malware that people have ever written, you know, to date. It basically works. Now, what's bad about uh, signature detection? Okay, I should say it works, and it's relatively efficient. Might not seem like it if you do a virus scan on your entire hard drive and you have to wait, you know, a day for it to finish, but it is sort of, you know, reasonably efficient as well. Nobody so what finds things it's seen before? Yeah, I mean, you have to have a signature. What does that mean, you have a signature? It means somebody's seen this malware before, somebody's extracted a signature, and studied it, really studied it, and extracted a reasonable signature from it. And not only that, they've extracted a signature and You've updated your signature file, right? So you've got that in your system to actually detect. OK, so that implies that you cannot detect malware that you've never seen before. OK, and that's sort of the holy grail of you know, malware and virus detection in general, is that people would like to be able to detect stuff that they've never seen before, okay, instead of relying on some you know, previously developed signature. OK. So again, it's effective on you know most things that people have developed, uh, and there's a little burden. You know, mostly it runs in the background and does its thing, and you don't have to worry too too much about it. Uh, signature files they're typically you know on the orders of ten, order of tens of thousands of signatures. However, at any given time, there's only a relatively small number of malware that are actually out there and active. Probably like a thousand, something on that, or they have like ten times that many, maybe a hundred times that many signatures that they're actually looking for. So why do they do that? Wouldn't it be a lot faster if they just look for the thousand active versions of malware instead of the tens or hundreds of thousands that, you know, are most of these, 99% of them, they're never gonna see? What's that? The moment you do that, <laughs> that's possible, okay, virus writers might be quick to develop other uh, attacks, but that's, you know, that's not the case today, so why don't we just look at those thousand, really speed it up? I don't think it speeds it up that much, because there are smart algorithms to... Yeah, it doesn't speed it up by a factor of 10, but it would speed it up, okay, it would definitely speed it up, okay? It's not linear, okay? Well, okay, I think the real reason is this. Suppose you work at Symantec and you only scan for a thousand viruses, but your competitor scans for a hundred thousand viruses. <laughs> Whose product are you going to buy? Come on. Okay, so I think there's some, some of that uh, in there. It would be smart to just scan for a few, but they sort of are forced to, to, to be able to detect all these rare things that probably will never show up. Okay. Uh, we also, we'll look at this, you know, but there are uh, sort of uh, advanced techniques that are really hard to detect or can't be, even be detected with uh, this approach. Okay, so what's an alternative? Uh, an alternative, which is actually used in some products, is uh, called change detection. Okay, so the idea is this. You have some malware, your system gets infected with some malware. Something has changed because of that, right? Because there are some bits that are now on your system that were not there before. 
Now, if it's a traditional virus, it's embedded itself in some other code, but now that code has changed, right? Or if it's a worm, it's a standalone <coughs> thing, something's changed. You know, no matter where it's hiding, there's some bits there that were not there before. Okay, so here's what we could do. We could, um, well, how can we detect a change in a file? Do we have any way to do that? Depends on the file system. Uh, well, generically, are there any techniques we've talked about? That tell CRCs. Uh, CRCs, okay. <laughs> Those work. <laughs> We're talking about smart people like Trudy, though. How do we detect smart changes by Trudy? We use a hash, a cryptographic hash. Okay, so here's, here's a strategy. We could go through all the systems on our file. We could compute a cryptographic hash of all these files, store those hashes away some safe location, right? And I'll come back later and rehash all these files and compare to those stored values. Okay, what do we know if something has changed? Okay, if we get a different value. Okay, that tells us that the file has changed, all right? Now, if it's some, you know, Windows system file that should never change and it's changed, we would be pretty suspicious, right? Okay, maybe something's going on there. On the other hand, if it's some file that changes all the time and it changed, it doesn't tell us anything, right? Okay, but the principle is you could conceivably detect an infection this way, right? By detecting that a file has changed. Okay, there's, okay, so what would be the benefit of such an approach? Relying on changes in the file? You wouldn't have to rescan files unless they've changed? No. It would detect unknown signatures, unknown viruses. That's true, okay. So that's true. You might save some work. But the big thing is you could conceivably detect viruses you've never seen before. Whether you've seen it or not, it still has to change the file, right? And if the file's changed, you could say, hey, this is probably infected. So that's a big deal, okay, that you can detect things that you've never seen before. Okay, what are the disadvantages then? Too many false positives. Lots and lots of false positives, okay, right? I mean, files change, okay, lots of files change. And you're the malware writer. Where are you going to put your virus if you know they're using this technique? Something that always changes. Something that changes all the time. You're not going to put it somewhere that shouldn't change. You're going to put it somewhere that should change. And what happens? Okay, think about it from the, from the good guy's point of view. You're going along and you detect a change in this file. What are you going to do with it? See. Throw it away? Put it in the trash? Hit delete? Right? No, it's an important system file. I need it. I don't want to have to reinstall the OS unless I have to, right? So what am I going to do? Leave it. Leave it? <laughs> yeah, who cares? Okay. Um, yeah, well, what they do in practice, actually, a lot of these systems is once they detect something unusual like this, they do a signature scan. So you kind of, if you do that, you sort of lost the biggest potential benefit you know, to, to this sort of approach. You know? So maybe they're using it more for efficiency than anything else, but they were kind of losing the uh, biggest benefit. Okay, so again, you don't miss anything. I mean, it's got to be somewhere, right? So you don't get any false negatives. You don't miss something. But the number of false positives is going to be really large. Okay, you're really going to put a burden on users or administrators or somebody to deal with all these false positives. Uh, and this is the big one, you know, you can detect malware that nobody's ever seen, okay? Even if nobody anywhere has ever seen it, it's just customized specially for you, you could conceivably detect it. Okay, again, the problems are all those other things we said, lots of files change, and so on and so forth. Uh, right, so if you detect that something has changed, but if it's a new virus, how would you know that it's infected? You know, this is a file that may have changed. I'm not sure if it changed. You know, if it's something that should never change, that's probably pretty clear. If it's something that changes a lot or changes, you know, fairly regularly, how do you know whether it's really an infection or just a allowed change in the file? You have to maybe, you know, and this is what they sometimes do. They fall back on a signature detection. They'll take that file and scan it with a signature detection system. If you detect a file, you know, virus, that's good, but if you don't, then what? All you know is the file changed, right? And if it's a new virus, you wouldn't detect it with your signature detection, right? So, so really the issue is what do you do with all these false positives, right? How do you handle those? Okay. <clears throat>